YouTube Electric Adventures here with the very first episode of my Let's Make a Retro Game series. Um, in this series, I'm going to try in, uh, as as in best as I can to try and explain the process of developing a retro game. But I mean, um, yes, it would probably be nice to do it completely as you would have done it back in the day. But that's not going to be very easy um, for a lot of the people out there who are curious but not necessarily have the levels of skills. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you how you can use a uh, modern PC and a few easy tools uh, to put together a game. And that way we can concentrate on the actual create the process of creating the game itself rather than you know worry about uh, which mach particular machine you have, um, environment and everything like that. It also allows you to write a game and not even actually have the system that it's intended for. Because um, the idea of this series is it's twofold. It's to share some of my love of retro game development with the community out there um, and also as an impetuous for myself to learn some other systems. Um, now, as you notice in the titles, I've actually listed quite a number of systems there that we're going to create the same game across all of those systems. And some of those systems, I haven't done a lot of programming on myself, so um, you, I'll actually be learning myself, preparing the episodes when we start converting to the other platforms. But I've also chosen a lot of the platforms for a particular reason in that they all use very similar architecture. And what I mean by architecture is they um, you know, most of the machines in the series use as the Z80 processor, so the assemblers code is going to be the same. Now there are going to be a couple of machines that don't use that processor, i.e. the Atari 8-bit and the Commodore 64. They will be done last, but it will be uh, an interesting exercise in translating what we've done up to that stage over to those platforms. I've also chosen a game that, um, I mean obviously I like you know, uh, shoot 'em up type games, and shoot 'em up type games are actually a good way to learn how to program. Because um, as long as you don't get too carried away, um, they, you can illustrate some of the basic ideas of what you need to do to actually make a game without it getting too complicated. Um, and I've chosen a game that will run on every single one of the, the systems that I've listed without too much effort. But we also should be able to, rather than just write it for one system and then blatantly port it across to the others, we're going to try and utilise as many of the native features of each machine as possible. Um, but the machine we're going to start with, uh, and so the, probably the first part of the series for a little while, will be based around the TI-99XX chipset machines as I call them. Now these particular chipset machines actually go all the way back to the original TI-99 computers. Um, the main graphical processor in those uh, is actually quite a um, capable chip. Um, TI basically made a slightly updated version of that um, graphics processor and was selling it to various chip manufacturers so it actually ended up appearing in quite a few different computers. And One of the very first computers to use that chipset was the original Spectre video machines which were actually invented or well, you know, the design was invented by two um, Hong Kong based Americans. Um, and their design, I mean, uh, and they didn't have a lot of money, they had to go around and raise money. So they designed that original design fairly early on. And that design ended up being, um, and they needed a basic, so they went to Microsoft. Uh, and being based in Hong Kong, um, they met up with um, a representative over in Asia. Um, and uh, Basically, uh, their design got shown around a lot of places as an interesting idea and then eventually evolved into the MSX standard later on. Um, but in the meantime, um, and this is uh, reasonably solid uh, conjecture, uh, it's agreed on by most of the people, that uh, Coleco were also uh, developing a, you know, they wanted to, to create a video game console. Um, they wanted to buy parts, as many as they could in America, that they could get away with. So they also started with the TI graphics chipset and a Z80, um, and were putting together their computer. But they couldn't quite get it to work. So they actually bought the original design off the two guys from Spectre Video. Um, and they then used that money to go on and later on produce their own Spectre Video computers. Uh, which is why the timeline can be a little bit hard to understand. Also, the design 
um, was shown by, um, by the way, the gentleman's name is, is Nishi, was shown over in Japan to a number of companies trying to promote the idea of a standard of computers. Um, and this is the early design that included um, all of the chips from TI other than the Z80s here. The Z80, the TI graphics processor, and the TI sound chip, which is the one that ended up in the Coleco and the one that ended up in the Sega SG-1000 console and SC-3000 um, computers. It also ended up in some of the other um, you know, TI-99 variants that are around the world. Um, but Spectre Video in the end decided to go for a sound chip from General Instruments which has, a little, uh, has more features. It doesn't tie up the CPU as much as that original TI one um, and I believe uh, may have actually been cheaper and because they were trying you know to cut down the cost of the machine but they wanted the machine to do particular things um, well I mean that's enough history so basically there are a whole bunch of machines that have very similar um, chip architecture so what we should be able to do as long as we don't overdo the type of game we're looking to make we should be able to easily convert that game across those systems quite quickly uh, graphically pretty much we can get all of the graphics done without with hardly changing a thing between the machines. Uh, there are two, two different types of sound chips so we will have to do two sets of sound. Um, sound will be a few episodes down the track. We'll mainly concentrate on graphics, gameplay um, and and you know general programming tips and things like that to start with. Uh, you your game doesn't have to have sound to start with. Let's get the action going and, and get a bit of a game together. Right, now as to the game that we'll be developing, um, I thought we'd go right back to the uh, very early roots of 8-bit uh, consoles and go for a game that it's, it is itself inspired by asteroids and um, space invaders in a way, um, and uh, but comes from another console uh, from back in the day that had a lot of inspired games, so we shall inspire a game from it, and it is Astro Smash. Now, let's turn it around. So Astro Smash uh, on the Intellivision is not a bad little game. It's, um, it's not that complicated, which is what we want. Um, it is perfectly achievable on all these machines. Now, I'm not saying it's going to look exactly like the Intellivision version, because the Intellivision um, graphics resolution is not uh, that high, but it could still make you know, perfectly acceptable, playable games. But the reason why we're choosing this is that the main player ship moves in a set plane down the bottom of the screen. Okay, so you know we should be able to get that part of the ship movement moving. And then we have bullets that fire up the screen. Um, and now our next more complicated things is we have rocks and and um, you know smart bombs and things like that that come down and not just straight down the screen. They come at uh, various angles. Uh, they also can break apart and turn into multiple objects. And then you can, um, you know, we can enhance the gameplay from the basic idea of Astro Smash um, with certain ideas as we go. Now, this series, uh, I will be recording um, multiple episodes in blocks, uh, doing a lot of editing and putting them together, um, because obviously this is a tutorial series. So I will try and provide as much information as I can, and maybe some, you know, graphical uh, diagrams and things like that. Um, hopefully my skills will improve at the various Adobe products that I'm going to use for the various diagrams and things and I'll try and make it as clear as possible. Also, uh, information about each, each episode will be available on my website, which I'll link down below, um, as, long as, as well as additional links to various bits and pieces as we go through each episode. So this first episode will probably be a bit longer because we've got this intro and I'd like to do something practical in this episode rather than just announce the title of the game. Um, I've actually written a uh, nice little sprite uh, editing tool um, and I thought I'd go through the process of downloading and um, installing that on your computer. Now before we go too much further, uh, I can't cover everything so in this particular series I will be assuming that we're working on a Windows platform. Um, I mean, yes, there's a lot of Macs out there, and most of the stuff that I show you, you can set up on a Mac. You do have to use some different tools. So um, none of the software that we'll be using uh, needs a license. It's all freeware and things like that. And there are alternatives to some of the software 
uh, that I'll show. Obviously, the sprite editor, I've written that one myself. Um, so, you know, free to for everybody in the community to use. And um, if you have any suggestions at any time on the series uh, or any of the pieces of software that I put together, they are most welcome. Um, you can send them through. And I hope that this game will be interactive. So we will develop it together. And I'm sure we can develop a game um, called, uh, at the moment its tentative working title is Mega Blast, um, which is given away when I show the sprite editor because I've put together a little set of sprites to help show that tool. So it was pretty much going to come out in this episode anyway. So at the moment the tentative working title is Mega Blast and we'll work on that. Um, and and see how we go. Alright, so to round up this episode, let's go and see how to download the Sprite Editor so you can all go and have a nice play of that um, before Christmas um, and after Christmas we can get back into um, some of the more slightly more technical things. Right, so here we go. This is how you download and install the Sprite Editor that I've put together for this series. Um, obviously you go to the electricadventures.net uh, website and view article and I'll, I'll put this link in um, down below in the notes for this episode. Um, when you, uh, I mean you can also get here by going to the home page and looking for th this title here which is TI99XX Sprite Editor. Um, so you can see a picture of the Sprite Editor there, all you do is you need to click here and then you get up this uh, loading page. Now you do need to have installed Microsoft, the Microsoft.NET framework first so I'll also include a link to that in my instructions in the video as well. We click on install uh, it may ask you to discard it, open it run and it comes up with this application install. Now there will be a security warning, um, I'm not earning any money from this, uh, a security certificate costs about $200 a year, it's not really worth my while at the moment so the um, publisher is Electric Adventures which is me so after a couple of seconds it will install, uh, now if will just get the web browser out of the way somewhere on your desktop you should see the icon so that's how you relaunch the application right so here we go the application itself it's divided up into a couple of areas uh, basically you have our edit grid here which is 16 by 16 pixels wide and shows the combination of four 8 by 8 areas and that's what the little red marks are you can turn those on and off by ticking and unticking this box it's got a few controls around the outside. Uh, next to it here is the color palette. Now this is the standard TI-99 color palette. Uh, the Spectrum has less colors. It has um, eight normal colors and some flashing versions of those colors. Um, and the Amstrad has a different color palette again. But we're not going to worry about that at the moment. So this is primarily going to be for the TI chipset uh, machines. We'll design the sprites for first and we'll convert them over later. Um, you have a command section here. Above here the sprite will show in two different sizes so you can see what it's like when you're drawing it. Uh, down here you can name the particular sprite um, and you can work in single colour or two colour mode. Now uh, the TI chipset does not have multi-coloured sprites for what is called MSX1 level but you can simulate more than one sprite by putting one sprite over the top of the other. Uh, now this editing tool allows you to do that and I'll put it in two color mode now um, and we'll select a couple of colors we'll set that one to blue and we'll grab uh, say that dark yellow and set that so that, that's our two colors set. Down here is the output mode it shows at the moment it's just one big block of hex hexadecimal. Now I mean I'm showing this and I haven't explained anything about number systems I will actually do that in um, what, one of the next episodes um, but you can actually output the sprite in different styles so if we type test here um, oh, that's a, I know, actually found a bug. it's amazing how you find that it puts the name in the um, text there for you 
so you can quite literally grab this copy and go and paste it into your text editor so that's one way of getting the um, the design that you've done out into your game um, but you can also save it as a complete set in um, so, uh, just there's a, a raw format for this sprite editor but it can also save it as um, as uh, in pure assembly format so I'm capturing this one window so I can't show you pop-up windows unfortunately so anyway what we can now do oops I changed the color is once you have a um, a color selected all you do is you hold the mouse down and you can draw on the grid and you can see the um, image forming in natural size and double size just to give you a bit of an indication of, of what you're making so we go into just doing a basic you know, missile or spaceship shape and at the moment you know concentrating on using one colour it's quite interesting the effects you can do um, so if I then go and put another colour in here you can sort of see what it would look like if you um, you know made it out of multiple colours so there's a, a, a little spaceship there um, and you can go and add a new sprite and of course one test two and you can see the first one appears in the list of sprites we have up here so say we wanted to make that red that's going to be some sort of a rock shape I'm only doing this really rough just to show you how the controls work and um, you know gradually I do know yeah there's a couple of little, um, little glitches in this program that I, I'll fix up at some stage the program will automatically update if I publish a version so currently what I'm doing this video is version uh, 1.005 um, but I may have fixed a couple of these bugs by the time you've downloaded this of course alright I'll load a sample file just so we can have a look at um, some of our things so this is what I at the moment what I'm considering for the um, characters to use in our game Mega Blast so I've designed a, um, a main ship and another thing I do is I center them I set position them on, in the top left corner. Uh, this allows you for hit detection to have a known size of your pieces rather than having them centered and then you've got an unknown amount of space around them. Just makes it easier later on. Uh, we have a large asteroid and we've got two different versions of that hopefully alternating between those two things because well, the large asteroid will mainly drop straight down the screen it'll look like it's rolling and then we have a small asteroid it has a, just a couple of little animations that will make it look like it's animating a laser which is just a really simple little graphic um, a smart bomb which will which has four shapes and will look like it's you know uh, spinning as it comes down the screen so there are our basic uh, shapes I'll make this file um, available uh, for download from my website in the first article so you've got something to play with um, you can also from your editing you can paste information into this window here um, so say you pasted this from your program so I'll put 255 there which is going to be a solid block and you press import there's this, so this is you've got one two I didn't mean to put there, one two three four are your blocks so one two three four I put that in the third one and the fifth row down one two three four five so there's and 255 means every pixel is set okay I hope you enjoyed that demonstration of the sprite editing tool um, and see how you're going getting so setting up and have a play with it uh, the link to that will be down below and there will also uh, be a link to my Electric Adventures page that covers this very first episode and it will have the link to the tool again and it will have the spot where you can download the, um, the data file for the sprite editor for the game Mega Blast that we're putting together.
and I'll continue to do that in format. There'll be one article on my website for each episode of this series. Um, and hopefully that gives you something to you know get into before Christmas. Uh, there'll be more episodes after Christmas. Uh, the next episode's coming up. We need to set up some more tools. We need to, well, we're going to be developing in ZAD to start with. So we're going to have to set up a ZAD assembler and have some form of text editor to edit that. So the next episode will cover that. And also, um, it, it will depend on length how uh, these episodes come together. We also need an emulator to be able to emulate the various computers so we can see it running on our PC without having to run it on a physical machine at this stage. Uh, and then once we've got all the tools out of the, those basic tools out of the way, uh, we'll get straight into it and we'll make something happen on screen. So it won't be too many episodes and we'll get into something that you can sink your teeth into. Now once again, series, I want it to be as interactive as possible. If anybody has any suggestions about, or even has, you know, wants to suggest some graphics for the game or anything like that, or sound effects, or needs, to, um, didn't quite understand something, I want a little bit more explanation, I will try and make the series as interactive as possible. Alright, I hope you've enjoyed the very first episode of the series, and um, please come join the journey and enjoy this as we work our way through. You're most welcome um, part of the series. Alright, I'm Electric Adventures, thanks to all my subscribers, and I'll catch you next time.